Okay. Hi, everyone. Today I have David Pierce with me. He is one of the best transhumanist philosopher, in my opinion. So, would you like to tell us about yourself, David, sir? Good heavens. <laughs> um, yeah, back in the year 1995, I wrote an online manifesto, The Hedonistic Imperative, uh, and in spite of its debauched title, it's actually an ethical plea for the use of biotechnology to phase out suffering throughout the living world and the creation of a new architecture of mind, life based entirely on gradients of intelligent bliss. Uh, and Yes, in 1997, a young postgrad at LSE called Nick Bostrom uh, read the manifesto, got in touch, and we set up the World Transhumanist Association, now Humanity Plus. Uh, now, transhumanism is an extraordinarily broad and diverse movement, embracing everything from radical life ext extension, super longevity, to super intelligence. But my own primary focus of my work over the past 25 odd years has been the abolitionist project uh, and the use of genetic engineering uh, to phase out the biology of suffering. Oh, okay, great. I think I got into transhumanism much before then I think I got into some other general philosophy, I suppose, like I'm much more currently into philosophy of religion, you know, metaphysics mm -hmm. and ethics and stuff like that. And I like before getting uh, into philosophy, I suppose, transhumanism and like the, these these subjects were really interesting to me, you know, like I was really, I, I, I was really sad about, you know, animal suffering and, human suffering generally, right? It, it was really sad to hear all these tragedies, you know. So to me, it was, uh, it was really good to hear that, you know, people uh, are like trying to, you know, make the world a better place and have a certain kind of optimism, right? Because generally, I think, philosophy has this very, I suppose, dry and sometimes really pessimistic nature where, you know, there, there is this view like bow down to the truth <laughs> and stuff like that, you know, and, you know, Schopenhauer, you know, David, David Benetton, you know, and like generally the, some of the philosophers are saying that do not have children, you know, and, you know, even perhaps even animals should not have children and everyone i mean the, the view is that like everyone is ultimately going to die due to perhaps heat death of the universe so why not just you know i suppose be antinatalist or something like that i mean it is uh, their view i do not think that antinatalism is generally a good position unless unless we know that a literal like planet or a black hole is like coming towards planet earth or something like that i think generally life is life is generally pretty cool i suppose you know it, it's pretty comfortable i think at least for me and i think for the people who who want to live you know and we are always trying to cure cure and treat the illnesses and you know trying to reduce suffering i suppose so um, yeah <laughs> i confess that i do have a very dark conception of life most transhumanists are optimists uh, i am temperamentally a pessimist however i do not think Antinatalism is a potential solution to the problem of suffering. All that 
all that being an antinatalist does and not having children is impose selection pressure against any predisposition to antinatalism. So I think if we're serious about tackling the problem of suffering worldwide, we need uh, to tackle its biological genetic roots. And though there will always be selection pressure against antinatalism, there needn't be selection pressure against a predisposition to want to have happy, uh, pain-free children. And if, and it's a huge if, we are prepared to make the, the evolutionary transition to a regime of designer babies, prospective parents are going to be able to choose everything from the pain tolerance to the approximate hedonic set point and hedonic range of their future children. Uh, and most parents, sincerely I believe, say they want their children to be happy. And uh, yeah, over the long run, I think there's going to be selection pressure in favour of having ever happier kids. Um, however, there is a great deal of resistance uh, to this idea. Uh, the creator of the first CRISPR babies in China was locked up recently for his hubris. He's just come out of uh, come out of prison. Um, I think initially uh, the reproductive revolution is going to take the form of what almost everyone will accept is therapeutic interventions to prevent various nasty, well-known genetic diseases. But depression, low mood, a predisposition to suffer uh, chronic, chronic pain, um, they can cripple quality of life too. And if we're ever to achieve the World Health Organization definition of health, complete physical, emotional, social well-being as set out in its constitution, we're going to have to tackle the biological genetic roots of suffering. Uh, at times, I can probably sound like a crude genetic determinist. I'm not. We all know that there are countless, countless, countless things wrong with the, uh, the world in terms of the environment. We need social, political reform, basic income, universal health care. We need to sort out everything from, you know, a war in the Ukraine to you name it. But nonetheless, we can get everything right in our environment and the chances are for evolutionary reasons we won't on average be any happier or unhappier than our ancestors on the african savannah natural selection did not design humans and non-human animals to be happy discontent is fitness enhancing the hedonic treadmill is fitness enhancing uh so yeah i unfortunately see several centuries of suffering still ahead. I'm not nearly as optimistic as some transhumanists. Some transhumanists believe in an imminent uh, uh, technological singularity. I think phasing out the biology of suffering is going to take uh, much longer. Um, but as I said, though I'm personally extremely pessimistic uh, for technical reasons, I think the problem of suffering is fixable. Uh, and I cautiously, tentatively predict that the world's last unpleasant experience is going to be a precisely dateable event a few centuries from now. Okay, so yeah, I, I do like the cautious approach, approach, approach perhaps, you know. So one thing is like, what, what kind of like current data uh, what do you think the current data trend is like is it uh, toward a more uh, cautious terrain or do you think it's generally very optimistic or something like that what do you think the current data suggests um could you be a little more specific uh in the question you're you're, you're asking me. Um, so like the trend is generally like, uh, like whenever I'm browsing the news, I mean, mm -hmm. of course there are, there, there is war, war happening and 
tragedy going on. But when you look at some of the research about diseases and illnesses, generally, I think mm -hmm. there are good treatment treatments being you know developed continuously. So, what trends do you see? you know, in ah, medicine. Okay. Perhaps the most uh, encouraging news I know is developments in the fields of cellular agriculture and cultured meat, because uh, perhaps the world's greatest source of severe and readily avoidable suffering is animal agriculture, in particular factory farming and slaughterhouses. And though I strenuously urge any of your listeners uh, to go vegan if they're not already, realistically, mm. the way to bring about this dietary uh, transition, and with it probably a moral revolution in our treatment of non-humans, is to ensure absolutely zero personal inconvenience to consumers. And I am cautiously optimistic that once cultured meat and animal products hit the supermarket shelves, that most people will go for the cruelty-free option and we can get slaughter slaughterhouses and factory farms shut and outlawed. Uh, and indeed, yeah, the Transhumanist Declaration of 1998, 2009, affirms our commitment to the well-being of all sentience. Uh, and in that sense, I think people in the West including some transhumanists, have much to learn from the traditions of the Indian subcontinent uh, of uh, Ahimsa. Uh, uh, Gautama Buddha famously said, let all that hath life be delivered from suffering. I teach one thing and one thing only, suffering and the end of suffering. Um, even what uh, might seem an extreme example Jayans, uh, Jayans who famously will sweep uh, the ground in front of their feet rather than uh, tread on an insect. Now, I think uh, many people, particularly in the West, will regard that as absurdly quixotic. But compared to post-human superintelligence, we are like bugs. Do little bugs, humble minds matter? Yes. Now, Transhumanists aren't Jains, um, but nonetheless, uh, I would urge in the long run some kind of high tech Jainism. Uh, modern biotechnology offers the promise not merely of getting rid of pain and suffering in humans, but spreading our benevolence, a term I'm rather self conscious about using given human history, but spreading our benevolence across the living world and it will be possible to compassionately manage the biosphere and use, uh, for example, something like synthetic gene drives that cheat the laws of Mendelian inheritance to spread benign, low pain, high happiness genes across entire species, use cross-species cross fertility regulation, immunocontraception, tunable gene drives, and, 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 and so forth genetically reprogram obligate predators essentially every cubic meter of the biosphere is going to be amenable to uh, surveillance and control now one can paint extremely dark orwellian dystopian scenarios of, of what this kind of global panopticon will in involve but it's also possible to sketch out scenarios in which all sentient beings can flourish uh, and that, I think, should be our long-term overarching goal. But uh, Darwinian life uh, has, I'm sure, many ugly surprises in store. The death spasms of the old order are going to be nasty. Uh, evolution designed, for example, coalitions of human male primates to wage territorial wars of aggression against other coalitions of uh, human male primates, and as we see in the invasion of the Ukraine right now, uh, yeah, uh, there are going to be nasty, nasty things happening this century. Um, but in the long run, for technical reasons, as I said, I think it is uh, probable that we're going to phase out the biology of suffering. So, 
What do you think about, I suppose, uh, a kind of an anarchist view? You know, like uh, there are philosophers like, you know, Michael Humer, Dave, David Friedman has, uh, have like said that generally uh, the governments and states uh, do more harm than good. They are almost always flawed, uh, generally without any form of states, generally private entities are better than solving many of the issues, including environmental issues than states or governments. Because, you know, if someone owns a certain part of, suppose, you know, a forest, right? Mm. They are willing to maintain those forests. And there is, uh, there is less problem of tragedy of commons, I suppose. You know, when people uh, actually own these these resources to take care of them, to maintain them, whether it's like forests or, you know, sanctuaries, you know, there are like conservationists who want to protect, you know, animals, you know, and perhaps help in reduction of animal suffering, I suppose. So, yeah, what do you think about that? Um, I mean, I can sympathize with the libertarian impulse um but we are social primates and all kinds of problems can only be sorted out i think with the use of central organization you know an example all too topical right now most of the wars of the past two centuries have been caused by nation states by nationalism and I would see the only long term or at least medium term uh, recipe for world peace is going to be some kind of democratically accountable world government or United, United Nations with a monopoly on the use of, 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 of force that anarchism in the realm of nation states doesn't work it's particularly in an era of wmd it's a recipe for nuclear war the idea of a democratically uh, elected world government probably sounds unrealistic the only realistic way i think it could come about is if nations were to enact legislation that kicks in a few decades from now so that it doesn't involve existing political leaders giving up their power. Um, but how realistic this is, I don't know. I fear we're sleepwalking to Armageddon, even if we manage to avoid uh, a nuclear conflict uh, uh, in the current God Almighty mess uh, in, in the Ukraine. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, I'm, though I'm optimistic about the long run, I fear the 20th century is going to, uh, yes, witness some catastrophic wars. Uh, and the only way I envisage uh, preventing them, yeah, is some kind of, uh, uh, of world government. So yeah, getting back directly to your question then, uh, in all kinds of uh, respects, individual liberty, personal freedom, rights, yes, but a whole raft of problems from uh, climate change, uh, regulating emissions to something as mundane as, you know, kind of global aeros aerospace, all kinds of things can only really be regulated at a central level, whether international, national, or, 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 or local. Uh, that libertarianism is fine for Robinson Crusoe, um, but humans humans are, aren't for the most part like Robinson Crusoe. Robinson Crusoe. Complete freedom uh, is impossible given that so many of our preferences and desires implicate others. So yeah, we need to uphold uh, the rule of law. I would hope uh, liberal, liberal values, although I hope that most aspects of Darwinian life can be left behind. One innovation that I think, uh, well, sorry, one institution that humanists would, transhumanists would do well to uphold 
is democracy. We all know democracy is flawed, but it seems to be the best way of ensuring accountability, peaceful transition of, of power. So uh, my uh, ideas there, at least, are fairly conventional. Oh, OK, cool, cool. I mean, I suppose, like, perhaps maybe uh, you could look at what I think perhaps uh, Michael Humer and David Friedman uh, said in their books about perhaps, you know, how to, you know, privatize. Perhaps some ideas would be useful in knowing that. I think because their arguments, uh, I think Friedman's arguments are also consequentialist. So it's not necessarily just about uh, just about rights based view. It's generally quite consequentialist in the sense. And he also perhaps presents ways to, you know, how even without any kind of states or nations or even world government, people will, you know, uh, basically have many of their rights respected, less harm and more happiness, I suppose. But of course, it's it's a, it's his book. It's a big book, I suppose. So, <laughs> so I cannot like summarize what he says in in uh, in a, a short conversation. I can just perhaps recommend the book. I think his book is called The Machinery of Freedom. It's the third edition, the latest or the latest one. I confess, I, all I have done is uh, read, read reviews and to do justice to someone's work and properly engage with it. Yeah, you should actually go to a re, a original texts. But yeah, one thing I try to, I mean, like most people, I have opinions on all sorts of subjects. But yeah, I try to avoid setting out all my opinions, you know, everything from peace in the Middle East to, <laughs> to you name it, and focus where I think neglected problems and in particular the nature of the negative feedback mechanisms of the hedonic treadmill um, because unless we actually tackle uh, our reward circuitry then essentially depression uh, and other uh, forms of uh, mental illness are going to persist indefinitely um, i was pleased to learn that your temperamentally fairly happy, but uh, a very large minority of people worldwide, hundreds of millions of people are clinically depressed. Hundreds, millions of more people suffer from uh, subclinical depression. Even people who aren't depressed, uh, much of their life is stained by frustrations and mundane disappointments. And yeah, uh, yeah. and essentially it's been extremely Adapt, uh, adaptive to be discontented a lot of the time. Now, what uh, I urge is not abolishing the hedonic treadmill. It's important to retain the information signaling role of, uh, of, of crudely speaking, good and bad stimuli, but ratcheting hedonic set points upwards. And it's instructive to look at case studies of people who are at the other end of uh, uh, uh of the hedonic scale you know life's temperamental super optimist super optimists uh, extremely resilient people who bounce through life and there was an ipsos opinion poll i think it's now about a decade old uh just asking people worldwide right now do you feel sad so so quite happy very happy top was indonesia second second was india third was mexico now anyone who knows anything about those three countries knows that they all have all manner of political social economic <laughs> economic problems but if you just look at the raw data not what opinion pollsters think ought to count as an index of a high quality of life, but what people actually say. Uh, external circumstances don't matter as much as one would suppose in the long run. This is the so-called lottery paradox. Six months after having a terrible accident or winning the lottery, most people will revert to their previous, approximately, to their previous level of well-being or ill-being before the 
accident or the or, or the tragedy. Um, and I think we need to think through the implications uh, of this because otherwise, 500, 5,000 years from now, uh, our successors will be having a similar uh, conversation. There'll be all manner of fabulous material delights. People will be living in, you know, maybe immersive VR, goodness knows what else. But unless we actually uh, 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 upgrade our reward circuitry, pain and suffering will last indefinitely. Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I, I suppose what generally, I think what sort of normative approach you take, what, what sort of normative ethical approach you take, some kind of uh, consequentialism or deontology, yeah, I'm a consequentialist. Uh, I'm loosely a secular Buddhist, technically a negative utilitarian. I think our overriding moral obligation is to minimize and prevent suffering. I should stress that no one who is sympathetic to the idea of the abolitionist project need buy into this ethic specifically. Uh, but yeah, this is my own like personal ethic, uh, that there's a story by Ursula Le Guin, the ones who walk away from Omelas. I don't know if you're familiar, familiar with it. There's this, in Le Guin's tale, this fictional city of Omelas, this city of fabulous delights. Everyone has a wonderful time having fun in all manner of different ways. Uh, and yet for unexplained reasons, the existence of the city of Omelas depends on a tormented child in the basement. And the citizens of Omelas know of the existence of this child, but they think it's a price worth paying for such torment. I say they know, but a minority of people from the city of Omelas, they walk away. Compared, yes, compared to all the all the wondrous delights of Omelas, it's only a single kid. But the suffering of even a single child outweighs all these fabulous delights. And yeah, I would personally walk away from Omelas. Now, what does walking away from Omelas actually uh, entail? Uh, some people uh you know david benatar an anti uh, uh an anti-natalist would yeah uh, urge everything from yeah human ex you know human extinction uh, uh yeah these kind of nihilistic uh, uh scenarios but i don't think this is a sociologically credible scenario for reasons we touched on earlier selection pressure and yeah instead i think the route forward is the abolitionist project, because if we aim to create life based on gradient, entirely on gradients of intelligent bliss, we can potentially at any rate have the support of all the world's life lovers, because uh, most people are not depressed or depressive. Most people are not negative utilitarians. Most people are not ni uh, 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 nihilistic. Uh, and yeah, the way to get the broadest possible coalition of support, I think, is to yeah uh, gather people from all. Uh, well, I say all. I was going to say all ethical traditions. That's not feasible. But for a wide variety of ethical, political, and religious traditions, because most people, most religions, most traditions give at least some weight and often a lot of weight to preventing, mitigating suffering. Um, uh, one of the big advantages of aiming for hedonic recalibration is that unlike traditional visions of utopia, it doesn't, re hedonic recalibration doesn't involve sacrificing your version of the good life, your preferences and values on the altar of someone else's conception of paradise. Uh, when I try to uh, conjure up what life paradise engineering really amounts to, 
I, I invite uh, the listener to imagine waking up tomorrow morning in an extremely good mood, but with their, uh, you know, their, their core values, preferences and relationships intact. Uh, so yeah, this isn't asking people to, to give up what they, what they value now, rather it's just a way to uplift everyone, hedonic uplift. There is logically simply no way to satisfy everyone's competing preferences. I mean, a mundane example would be football. Only one team can win the cup kind of thing. Most people, uh, but such examples can be can be multiplied. But what one can do is ensure that all football supporters are generically happy, even though they're happy, even happier when their team wins uh, than loses. And one can apply this more generally to personal relationships, to politics, to economic life. This hedonic uplift that we know at default hedonic tone, hedonic range is very high genetic loading. We're teasing out its molecular genetic basis. Uh, and I favor the use uh, of everything from pre implantation, genetic screening, counseling, soon designer babies, soon to the ability to upgrade your own DNA. It's being explored now for a number of well-known and lesser well-known genetic diseases, but within a few decades, it will be possible for existing humans to upgrade uh, their reward architecture. So yeah, I mean, all kinds of things could go wrong. I mean, this, this, this goes without saying, but hence the need for uh, intelligent planning. Uh, all children today born are unique, untested genetic experiments. And I think if you consider it morally acceptable to conduct such genetic experiments, you have an obligation to load the genetic dice in your children's favor. Hmm. I think I, I would, yeah, I, I mean, I, I consider myself a kind of a moral, subscribe to a moral, uh, moral pluralism, I like, I like to call it, you know, mm -hmm. so rather than taking just one specific theory, you know, rather than some kind of a monistic theory, mm -hmm. like uh, something like what Peter Singer does or something like those theories like even in peter singer's book i think the general approach he takes like i think in his book animal liberation or something or may, perhaps maybe one of in one in one of the one of the major books even his approach seems to be general sort of uh, moral uh, moral pluralism which is uh, that like he's not trying to convince you first of utilitarianism and then then you know then you know of his position he actually uses some of the general common sense you know uh, morality that people have so i think yeah so i think pretty much any you know moral pluralist would agree with like reduction of suffering you know helping animals you know and stuff like that, though I, I do think there are perhaps some kind of theories like, you know, like perhaps maybe like divine command theory, maybe some sort of divine command theory, which tells people to obey certain laws, they must obey them, even if even if it does not bring them any happiness, right, <laughs> like they have to obey that this is how even even in their house even in their own homes they have to behave in this way they have to keep you know they have to keep the prayers or something like so like since i'm more into like philosophy of religion i have read that i think this is like a view in traditional catholicism that if you believe in traditional catholicism if you believe that it is true then you have an obligation to go to church every Sunday, mm -hmm. attend the mass. And if you do not do it, then that's like disrespecting God, 
you know that's like disrespecting god and and disrespecting god or you know any 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 command breaking any command of god is very very serious like very very severe so yeah. fortunately there is nothing in the the bible uh, that says uh, thou shalt not use pre-implantation genetic screening and counseling in genome editing uh, <laughs> though i'm not personally religious i would generally ask someone who is religiously inclined just to imagine what would an you know a, an all merciful all compassionate god want for his creatures and if mere mortals can envisage the well-being of all sentience uh, of life based entirely on gradients of bliss of some kind of garden of eden in our wildlife parks it seems almost blasphemous to suggest that god would want more suffering more cruelty um uh and yeah there is the element I mean, I said, particularly if it's a Christian audience, I would, you know, selectively quote passages from the from the Bible, the book of Isaiah, peaceable kingdom, lion and the wolf will lie down with the lamb, uh, point out that the Garden of Eden was was vegan. Uh, one can only go so far in the face of real religious uh, dogma, but most of the world's it's all of the, the world's great religion do uh, do uh actually, I, should, I, should, I, should, I was going to make a sweeping generalization then but i i thought thought better of, better of it but let's say the abrahamic uh, religions uh, they do yeah envisage an all merciful all compassionate compassionate god um we touched earlier on the religions of the Indian sub some continent. You're better qualified uh, to talk about uh, the different religious uh, traditions uh, than me. But actually, uh, yeah, people from uh, from India in particular are often more sympathetic to the idea of a pan species welfare state uh, than people in the West. Yeah, I mean. I, I'm, I'm not religious, but I do believe in God. I do believe that, you know, God is kind, compassionate, you know, merciful, you know, loving and, you know, uh, just, you know, he cares about justice. And I think one of the things that I think, as, as you said, right, like, I think God would love the fact that human beings are like, trying their best to, you know, reduce suffering and help each other, care for each other, you know, bring happiness to each other, love each other, you know, be compassionate to each other. You know, one of the, there is, I think, a book by David Schmidt. He's a philosopher at, I think, University of Arizona. I think in his book, The Elements of Justice, he talks about like, uh, what is due to individuals what is due to uh, perhaps like individuals who are suffering or perhaps what is due to individuals who cannot protect themselves like what is due to children right their needs what is due to an employee you know fair treatment or something like that so justice seems to involve caring about others right and caring about others happiness so i think pretty much every plausible view of god would involve caring about each other and you know reduction of suffering and in, you know increasing happiness and stuff like that and caring about animals you know yeah i would hope so i would hope so uh, yeah, the history of organized religion isn't uh, entirely encouraging. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yes, uh, the state of the world doesn't encourage me. Well, I haven't seen any evidence personally of benign providence at work, uh, whether from a uh, benevolent traditional deity to some kind of uh, simulator if you take the simulation hypothesis 
uh, 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 seriously. Um, no, just the kind of blind, pitiless uh, uh, indifference. Um, but either way, as I said, rather than uh, emphasizing the differences with uh, traditional uh, religion and politics, I said, I think we should be anyone who cares about suffering should be aiming to build bridges and trying to create the broadest possible coalition in favor of a, yeah, a, a more civilized world. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. So one of the questions I had was like, when you like, how did you get into this? Uh, movement? How did you like get into the philosophy of like reducing suffering, you know, the hedonistic uh, imperative as your book title, right? Like, how did you get into this, all of this? Mm -hmm. Well, I was a very uh, depressive, introspective uh, teenager. Uh, and yeah, I'm a third generation vegetarian vegan. I was being concerned about the problem of suffering of non humans too. Uh, and yeah, I think I discovered in some pop science book as a teenager the idea of wireheading, which is not what I urge, but nonetheless, it came as a revelation. It was possible that wireheading is this idea that if electrodes are optimally uh, placed mesolimbic dopamine system that the rat or any other uh, human or non-human animal will keep on pressing continuously to gain uh, the reward. Now our understanding of wireheading has evolved uh, uh, since then but nonetheless yeah the, the idea that it was possible to be perpetually happy this struck me as very exciting. Now, one soon realizes that most people are not attracted to the idea of wireheading, uh, and that if we are to retain critical insight, social responsibility, personal development, yeah, behaving ethically towards each other, it's important to retain information sensitivity. And then you know, reading up about yeah psychopharmacology, how antidepressants worked, uh, the prospects of gene therapy. Over time, this was in my uh, mid to late teens, early twenties. Uh, yeah, the, the kind of germ of this kind of blueprint for a, a happy biosphere, this new motivational architecture. Yeah, life based on gradients of intelligent bliss. But I always used to assume that my views were unpublishable because uh, most people would regard a lot of this stuff as pretty far out and crazy now. But imagine, <laughs> imagine people's response uh, uh, last century. But uh, yeah, then uh, the development of uh, the World Wide Web, Web, web 1.0, uh, the realization that it was possible to circumvent normal publication processes and just publish online. And so, yeah, uh, publishing my ideas in the form of this online manifesto. Uh, it's written in a rather clotted academic uh, uh, style. Uh, and yeah, so my more recent work is much more uh, accessible. But yeah, I suppose I worked out the core ideas fairly early uh, on, though this was before the human uh, genome was decoded, let alone, uh, you know, something like gene drives hadn't been uh, uh, di uh, uh, discovered. Um, of course, there's far more to transhumanism than the abolitionist project, my preoccupation. Uh, the other two big strands, super longevity and super happiness, my own uh, acquaintance with superintelligence initially didn't uh, extend beyond an interest in uh, modest intelligence amplification via smart drugs uh, and the like. Uh, um, life extension, well, yes, as a, once again, from a very early age, I was preoccupied by uh, aging and death. Uh, I, you know, I wanted to have my 
brother's uh, pet guinea pigs no dropped, uh, put into suspect she died giving a childbirth terrible event for my brother. Uh, as, as a kid, I wanted uh, Snowdrop uh, kept in the freezer so she could be reanimated at a, at, 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 at a later date. Um, yeah, uh, interest uh, in technologies of uh, life extension. But yeah, it's only the transhumanist movement uh, that brings these different strands all together. Uh, now, the transhumanist movement for the first decade of the century, the World Transhumanist Association or Humanity Plus was the kind of overarching organization. Uh, since then, the influence of transhumanist ideas has increased, but the, uh, uh, but the movement itself has fragmented, though Humanity Plus continues to play uh, a, 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 major, a major role. Um, but yeah, all manner of twists and turns to the uh, plot here. The uh, the definitive history of the transhumanist movement has yet uh, yet to be written. But as long as I'm able, I'm yeah going to continue to plug my particular uh, conception of, of 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 what we should be doing. Yeah. Do you think that we would be able to do something about the heat death of the universe? <laughs> um, <laughs> cosmology is currently in flux, as you know. There are different uh, speculative scenarios, all manner of of uh, of, of you know everything from uh, 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 travel via worm, you, you name it. Um, although I take a uh, keen layman's interest in such issues, I'm not convinced we actually understand the fabric of reality well enough uh, yet. So, um, yeah, I'm not going to uh, pronounce uh, on these issues here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, you know, they, 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 uh, <laughs> Was it the evaporation of the last super, you know, super massive black holes, uh, uh, you know, 10 to the power 100 plus or what have you years from now? Yeah, uh, at the risk of being parochial, I think we have more urgent things to worry about. Let us tackle the problem of suffering. And once we have phased out the biology of suffering, yes, then we can consider the kind of the wider cosmologic cosmological issues um so do you think that theism generally some kind of you know optimistic kind of uh, theism help in help with mental health of people you know some kind of optimistic belief about god you know belief in god that yeah do you think that is helpful for you know St Statistic statistically, I mean, so long as one doesn't believe in the kind of God who is going to punish you for all eternity with damnation, um, <laughs> but other things being equal, yes, belief in, uh, uh, you know, uh, an, uh, an all merciful God, belief that everything has uh, a purpose. Uh, yes, I think it is good for mental health. Um, but uh, there is the snag <laughs> that, yeah, sadly, I just don't see any evidence that belief in God is, is true. I say I'm an agnostic, and because we don't understand reality, I willingly accept I, I could be profoundly mistaken. Uh, and traditional theism has been reborn in the guise of the, the simulation argument that Nick Bostrom uh, originated. Uh, if you make some seemingly plausible assumptions, assumptions that I don't in some cases buy into, like digital sentience, but if you think it is likely that uh, post-human civilizations will run ancestor simulations and if you believe that these ancestor simulations will be empirically indistinguishable from what you and i are experiencing now 
then statistically it is more likely that uh, we are in an ancestor simulation than in primordial basement reality. Uh, as to what the, uh, the notional purposes of our simulators uh, or simulator uh, is, well, that would have to be highly speculative, but uh, yeah, you could say this is a reversion, uh, a supposedly naturalized, secularized version of some, some form of theism. But with this uh, revival uh, is, you know, all the ancient problems of theodicy. This, uh, this uh, theodicy attempts to explain the, uh, you know, the, the, the justice, wisdom, the benevolence of a creator in the light of the terrible, terrible suffering in the world. Uh, yeah. And yeah, so sadly, I think a more compelling uh, account of why we're here today is provided by, uh, by natural science, ultimately physics. I'm not a materialist, but I am a physicalist. The two uh, terms are often conflated, but yeah, materialist science doesn't actually understand the intrinsic nature of uh, reality, the nature of the mysterious fire in the equations. And uh, I personally find it credible that the intrinsic nature of the physical, the fire in the equations differ from our naive materialist classical intuitions. But the mathematical formalism of the standard model that unifies electromagnet electromagnetism, weak and strong force, but not gravity, this kind of mathematical straitjacket constrains our theorizing about the intrinsic nature of the world's fundamental fields. Um, and yeah, so I'm afraid I just do not see uh, evidence for providence. Oh, I could be wrong. <laughs> of course, of course, it's cool. You know, I do, I do not believe in some kind of an angry God who is like going to send people in eternal hell forever or something <laughs> like that. I mean, I do believe that there will be some, perhaps some, not perhaps, I think I do believe that there will be some punishment for those who have done uh, evil things like like if, if they have caused some suffering, some harm, like, so, I mean, one advantage of, I suppose, theism is that when you see the injustices, right, like someone being uh, killed by another person who, who was never punished, right, on this planet, on this world, uh, one advantage of theism is that, well, there will be some punishment for that person who has caused the damage and the suffering. So, I mean, in, in some sense, it, there, there are like some psychological benefits of theism, I think. Yeah. In, yeah, in, in medieval times, an unhuman animal who killed a, a human could sometimes be put on trial counsel for the defense was appointed and if the non-human animal was uh was actually found guilty the unfortunate animal would then be executed and i think advanced uh post-humans would regard our notions of praise and blame in a similar light that uh, like most people i read about humans doing terrible things to other humans and non-human animals. And I, yes, I feel that, yeah, oh, I would like to see punishment, but ultimately we're all victims. We're all puppets. I think really praise and blame need to be used uh, instrumentally that, yeah, even, even fundamentally decent people do things that cause uh yeah. do things that cause suffering uh and that generally it's not fruitful in any met metaphysical sense to blame people including people who who do who do terrible things uh, because yeah under the aspect of eternity yeah uh we're not responsible for our actions we didn't choose the laws of physics uh, uh we didn't choose 
evolution by natural selection. We're only here because our ancestors, some of our ancestors did terrible things and the predisposition is still there, whether to yeah, sexual coercion or waging war, all kinds of all kinds of nasty stuff is latent uh, within us. So, yeah, and this is the kind of it's easy to be wise if you're not caught up in a situation. Of course, you know, if the barbarians are at the gate or goodness knows other situations, I can be as uh, as vengeful as the next person. But yeah, we ought to realize that this is yeah, that this is that, that this is primitive stuff. Oh, so I mean, like, I think that since I'm uh, since I'm an optimist, you know, I, I like <laughs> a universalist, I think that even those who have committed crimes, right, like, if, if, if they are punished, they are punished uh, for their, like, for correction, perhaps some form of retribution, maybe, I think some form of retribution would be there because that's my moral intuition, <laughs> you know. But should should I we think... trust our moral intuitions more? You know, our intuitions more in morality than we do in, let's say, quantum physics. Uh, I'm skeptical. And there's there's another point too that traditional notions of praise and blame, retribution and punishment have presuppose this, this idea of an enduring metaphysical ego um, but someone like Derek uh, Parfit or more traditionally Buddhists uh, recognize that enduring metaphysical egos are a myth and it's really it's a form of scapegoating I mean one reads you know for example in the states that say someone being executed for a crime their namesake committed 20 years ago. Now, this is, this, you know, this is, this is, this is absurd. Uh, it is, it is a different entity that committed, committed, the, uh, committed the, the, the crime. So yeah, I think uh, traditional notions of, of justice are skewed in so many ways that for the foreseeable future, we're going to need to maintain the fiction of enduring metaphysical egos and they're going to need to maintain something akin to traditional uh, justice uh, system but ultimately it's it's metaphysical foundations are rotten oh i mean rehabilitation too right like it's in it's some sense so i think that they will be rehabilitated, right? Like there will be a punishment for rehabilitation. You could think of, you know, if, if that makes sense to you. Because personally, I think it's justice seems to involve, like criminal justice seems to involve deterrence, you know, uh, rehabilitation, retribution, and restoration in my view, like all four, I think seems to, make sense right like i mean if someone hurt me right there is an intuition to you know let them pay like teach them a lesson right like they do not do it so they do mm -hmm. not do it again or something like that and once once they learn yes. their lessons they show rich they show remorse you know they they are guilty and they take responsibility and start doing good things so then they will be, then they will, once they serve their sentence successfully, they will be accepted back into society, right? So that's my view of theism. Like once they serve their sentence, God will welcome them in heaven, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, as I said, I more inclined to the view that we are all victims, even when we behave badly um uh but <laughs> yeah sorting out the criminal justice system is something that uh yeah it's uh, probably a topic for another another occasion but what is it something like yeah. two million people in the uh in the united states are uh, in some what is it's some say it in 
you know, enmeshed in the criminal justice system, many from uh, uh, ethnic minorities. Uh, yeah, there are much, much better ways to to, to organize uh, society that yes, for the foreseeable future, a small and I do emphasize a small minority of people will need uh, to be uh, locked up, but prison existing prison doesn't rehabilitate people. It's suffer suffering on the whole tends to embitter people. Uh, it doesn't make them uh, uh, wiser or kinder. Uh, yeah, it, it is dreadfully crude. Okay, okay. So uh, one of the things compared, I mean, it, it, yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, I was gonna say, yeah. because give the example, this, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with the drug uh, MDMA or ecstasy. Anyone who takes MDMA ecstasy uh, is likely to have a tremendous sense of love and compassion. Not for nothing is it called a hug drug. Uh, everyone <laughs> loves everyone else on MDMA. Now, sadly, MDMA itself is not sustainable. It's potentially neuro toxic. I'm most certainly not urging everyone to go out and take MDMA. But nonetheless, it shows what social life could be like. We take it for granted this quasi sociopathic indifference that we have to most other humans that you know, if one goes out in the street, yeah, one is one's heart sink, it sinks, oh, God, is this person going to ask me for money kind of thing, one doesn't feel like going up and giving him a hug or anything like that, that just with a small molecular tweak, one can suddenly have a radically different kind of organization just for, for 90 minutes or a couple of hours. Now, I would hope, yeah, looking forward to a kind of future civilization, that we could have something akin to an MDMA-like society, but that would take uh, an alteration in our existing genomes, whether some form of utopian pharmacology or in the long run, some genetic uh, tweaking. I'm a little cautious about uh, urging this vision because I mentioned earlier how I try not to uh, talk too much about my version of the good society and paradise and encourage people to imagine their own. But we shouldn't imagine that human transhuman society will always be this uh, Darwinian world of a lot of the time, sadly, of, of, of people hurting each other and behaving in self-serving ways. Mm. So one of the things that one of the things that I think uh, is interesting is that I think we both share the intuition of love, compassion, mercy, right? And so, some sometimes like in the traditionalist view about God was that like God has this status, right? Like God has this great status and any kind of offense against such a being deserves infinite suffering or something like that. Like, do you share that intuition? <laughs> well, yes, my fair, I mean, my parents, uh, uh, Belong, well, uh, Order of the Cross and Quakerism and their conception of God was rather different. But yes, the traditional God of the Old uh, Testament, God generally of the Abrahamic religions, is yeah a tyran tyrannical despot who demands uh, to be loved. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yes, although I think it is likely that life on earth is going to evolve into quasi divine beings, uh, crudely speaking gods, so not omnipotent gods, one would hope that the attributes of divinity that uh, our successors 
uh, imitate and not those of you know, traditional gods, whether of the uh, of the Greek gods or the uh, the Old Testament. Uh, so, yes, a, a rather uh, unappealing uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> vision of it's really, divinity. It's really strange thing to think about like when i first heard about this eternal conscious torture right eternal eternal kind of hell i thought i thought this just sounds the most messed up thing i've ever heard <laughs> like and the, the justifications for 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 this kind of view is like god is this great being with great status and you know you you must not do anything to so great being or because you are like you're like you are like offending a being with infinite dignity or something and <laughs> and when you do that you are you have committed a crime of infinite seriousness and a crime of infinite seriousness deserves infinite punishment with it, it maximum suffering. <laughs> it's so weird. It's, it's so strange, right? I mean, yeah. yes. Although I think the future lies in secular scientific rationalism, not materialism, but secular scientific rationalism, uh, I don't necessarily believe that uh, the future lies in the absence of spirituality. On the contrary, as molecular neuroscience teases out the basis of spiritual experience, whether you call it the divine, but yes, spiritual experience more generally, it'll be feasible to create states of super spirituality lifelong spiritual ecstasies far richer than anything physiologically possible today even temperamentally spiritual and religious people often report dry periods uh, they don't go through life very very rarely in a state of perpetual religious uh, ecstasy whereas yeah mastery of uh, the genome mastery of the uh, yeah, the neural pathways of spirituality will enable us, optionally at any rate, to refine, purify, and amplify these these these, these spiritual states and, and, and create something far more spiritual than anything that has ever existed. Now, this isn't uh, a prediction. I I'm merely noting that it'll 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 technically be possible to yeah. create a, a, a civilization based on super spirituality yeah and and a, and a kind of optimistic kind of spirituality and not this this oh extreme... absolutely oh good heavens yes yeah <laughs> yeah not the not the extreme traditional you know fear-based spirituality right where you where you are I think it, it causes people a lot of fear, right? Eternal hell. And yeah. it makes people do weird things sometimes, very strange things. Mm. Like, like one of the, I think uh, one of the reasons I heard that there should be like death penalty for apostasy or blasphemy, right? <laughs> There should like the, their reasoning. The reasoning of the traditionalists for these views was that, look, you are taking away the, you are taking away people's likelihood of getting to heaven. You, you are making the world such a way that people are more likely to go to hell by spreading atheism or agnosticism or apostasy or blasphemy or stuff like that and i mean that's i mean if, if god is a being like that who is like so angry and gets is going to torture people for like apostasy or agnosticism or atheism or blasphemy i mean the god does not sound like a god it more yeah. sounds like the i mean this is why 
is that though it may promote certain forms of mental health, uh, I would not generally encourage religious superstition and obscurantism. I mean, yeah, you see, if I believe that the only way to pre to prevent your uh, only way to ensure that your eternal soul in, enjoyed bliss in heaven was to torture you now to uh, uh, to make you repent your heresies, I hope I would have the moral courage uh, to do so. You know, someone like Tork Torquemada, Torquemada, you know, the Spanish Inquisition wasn't the Inquisitor wasn't trying to be evil uh this is it if if you believe this this you know this essentially nonsensical ideas then you will do uh do terrible things so yeah i am yeah extremely then skeptical of traditional religion i am when it comes to spirituality uh as i, as I said uh possibly super spirituality in future but as soon as one moves from saying that we're going to abolish the biology of suffering and create life based on gradients of bliss to specifying what kind of bliss our descendants will enjoy is it is, is it going to be spiritual is it going to be secular i suspect the state spaces of consciousness that our successors enjoy will be utterly unlike anything, uh, you know, as different as is waking from dreaming consciousness. I think there are billions of different state spaces of consciousness. We're going to be able to explore uh, that, whereas today taking psychedelics can easily mess your head up and destroy epistemic rationality. In future, it's going to be possible safely to explore the state spaces of consciousness. And the state space of spiritual experience is only one of of of, of, of billions of different kinds. Um, yeah, yeah. So, like, I suppose this is the end of our recorded conversation. I suppose you can still like stay here for a while. I I wanted to talk to you about uh, perhaps something else. I will stop the recording now. So anyways, if you, anyways, so uh, my friends, if you liked the video, then be sure, be sure to subscribe, you know, for more of this content. Thank you, everyone.